Okay, this uh, three over five factor is actually the uh, average. You see, average energy. So if you would like to calculate the average energy per particle, what you would do, average energy of states, let's say, which in this case will be the average energy per particle, this will be equal to the epsilon in zero temperature from zero to Fermi energy, A epsilon, epsilon over from zero to Fermi energy, the epsilon A epsilon. This will be the average. And this is equal to from zero to the Fermi energy, the epsilon. This density of states of the constants which just cancel is just epsilon square root of epsilon. So epsilon to the three halves divided by from zero to epsilon fermion, the epsilon, epsilon to the power one half. And if you evaluate this, this is nothing but three over five epsilon fermion. So it's not just a half, but three fifths the Fermi energy, that's the average energy of the states contributing to the total energy. And you just multiply it by the uh, number of particles in these states, you get the total energy. Now, this is what happens at zero temperature. So essentially what we had used here is as a function of energy. If you look at the Fermi Dirac distribution, it was just a step function at zero temperature, this is what we have at t equal to zero. This is a epsilon Fermi or the mu at t equal to zero. Now, if you increase the temperature, you see the Fermi energy has a characteristic temperature of the order of 10 to power, power 4 Kelvin. This is the uh, Fermi temperature. Now, room temperature, which is just uh, 10 to the power 2 Kelvin of the order, or at that order, is much smaller than the Fermi temperature. So the room temperature for such a fermionic system is actually low temperature. Limit. So it's very low, very small. Um, now, we have all these uh, states occupied. None of the above states are occupied. Now we are giving some energy to the system, typically of the order of the, the KT. Now, an electron over here, a kT in this level just corresponds to a very small energy, let's say, at low temperatures. If you consider an electron over here, if it absorbs an energy kT, it should go to a state over here. But that's, those states are occupied. So that electron cannot absorb that thermal energy. It will just stay where it is. It will not feel the temperature in a sense. But if you have a state, an electron, in a state close to the Fermi level, if it absorbs that kT amount of energy, it will go to this state, which is free, unoccupied. So if we increase the temperature, only the electrons very close to the Fermi level will uh, acquire some additional energy. So they will be excited, so to speak. So the uh, occupation number of states slightly below the Fermi energy will get smaller. But the occupation number of states slightly above the Fermi energy uh, will become non-zero. So at high temperatures, our Fermi Dirac temperature, high meaning still lower than the Fermi temperature, the lower low-lying states will still be completely occupied. As you come close to the Fermi energy, some of them will get excited. So this, uh, the number of fermions in that the excited states will be diminished. So this is what it will look like. This is for a temperature larger than zero, but nevertheless at low temperature. And this thickness of this uh, region, where it deviates from this step function, this is of the order of kT. For temperature very uh, small, it will be a very narrow band. Now the next task, our next task will be, so how can we get an approximate expressions for I don't know, the energy, pressure, the specific heat, etc. for our system at temperatures lower than the Fermi energy. Now we have, uh, in general, we basically need to evaluate integrals of this form, the epsilon, some function of epsilon, 
in the case of the total number, this is the square root of epsilon. In case of the energy, this is the epsilon to the power 3 halves divided by uh, e to the power beta epsilon minus mu uh, plus 1 from 0 to infinity. So we will be trying to get an approximate expression for such integrals. Now we see if it was from at zero temperature, we would have basically some contribution from zero to uh, let's say mu the epsilon f epsilon divided by e to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus one plus we would have the remaining terms from mu to infinity the epsilon f epsilon divided by e to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus 1. Now let me call this beta times epsilon minus mu sum x. So that uh, then my first integral or well let me just ex exclude the beta over there epsilon minus mu. So the first integral will just become uh, well, when epsilon is equal to mu, it is zero. When epsilon is equal to zero, it is minus mu. Times a uh, dx, f of, well, epsilon is x plus mu, divided by e to the power of beta x plus one, plus from zero to infinity, dx, f of x plus mu, divided by e to the power beta x plus 1. Well, in the first integral, let me just change a variable. x, is, x goes to minus x. So it goes from 0 to mu dx f of x plus mu divided by e to the power minus beta x plus 1 plus from 0 to infinity dx f of x plus mu divided by e to the power beta x plus 1. Sorry, this is not x, this is minus x. Now the integrals look kind of different, but because in the first integral I have this 1 over e to the power minus beta x plus 1, but this is nothing but e to the power beta x divided by e to the power beta x plus 1 which I can write as 1 minus 1 over e to the power beta x plus 1. So the, my integral now became 0 from 0 to mu dx of f of minus x plus mu plus from 0 to infinity dx f of x plus mu divided by e to the power beta x plus 1 minus from 0 to this time mu dx f of minus x plus mu. This integral is this term, this integral is this term. So my result from 0 to infinity, the epsilon f of epsilon divided by e to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus 1. Now in the first integral I can just go back to my initial variables and if I go back to my initial variables the first term is from 0 to mu the epsilon f of epsilon. This is my step function. Plus I have the other two integrals which are just corrections. Now you see mu is large. So if you look, okay, beta is large, mu is large. So, uh, so uh, the upper limit, the contributions from the upper limit will be exponentially suppressed in the second integral. So I can basically replace this mu by infinity and the result will not be changing much. If I change my upper limit by infinity, the result will be, I can just combine these two integrals and I get from 0 to infinity dx f of x plus mu minus f of minus x plus mu 
divided by e to the power beta x plus 1. OK, so uh, beta is large. So the uh, larger values of x will be suppressed exponentially. So the main contribution to the second integral will again be from small x. So if it is from small x, I can just make an expansion. f of mu plus minus x would be equal to f of mu plus minus f prime of mu times x plus minus f second prime of mu x squared over 2 factorial plus up to infinity. So basically f of mu pl uh, plus x minus f of mu minus x will be equal to twice f prime of mu x plus terms of the order of x cubed. Already we said that it will be the small values of x that will be dominating and the next correction will be of the order of x cubed. So uh, up to terms of the order of x cubed, let's say, which will be uh, of the order of x cubed, my uh, integral This is equal to from 0 to mu d epsilon f of epsilon plus twice f prime of mu from 0 to infinity dx x over e to power beta x plus 1 plus higher order terms. Now let me make one more change. In the last integral, I can just define this beta x as my new variable. And this is our final result, plus other corrections. Well, this, that number, that integral is just a number. We can evaluate that number. pi squared over 12. So this is just pi squared over 12. So that's the result of this integral. At low temperatures is from 0 to mu, the epsilon f of epsilon plus pi squared over 6 kt squared times the derivative of that function evaluated at mu. Plus, of course, higher order terms. So this approximation would basically allow us to, uh, to find the corrections to mu. And once we have the corrections to mu at, at finite temperature, we can calculate everything else we want. So let's start. What is the first correction to the chemical potential at low temperatures? Now that expression we obtain from this one, from 0 to infinity, the epsilon, a epsilon, 
uh, 1 over e to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus 1. And this is equal to 0 to mu d epsilon uh, a epsilon. This is the first term. Plus pi squared kt squared over 6. Well, the derivative of a would be just uh, 1 over 2 mu 1 over 2 epsilon times a epsilon which is a of mu plus well the higher corrections will be of the order of kt over mu cubed Now, what was a epsilon? So, a epsilon is basically uh, this result over here. This is our a epsilon. This is 2 pi g v 2 m to the power 3 halves epsilon to the power 1 half. H cube. Hmm? H cube. Well, the first term You see, this is okay, so uh, I don't want to uh, bother with these factors over there. You see, we have n is equal to 0 to epsilon Fermi, the epsilon a epsilon, which is a epsilon 2 thirds epsilon Fermi, a of epsilon Fermi. Two thirds epsilon Fermi to the three halves. A of mu divided by uh, mu to the power one half in general. And this integral zero to mu, the epsilon a epsilon is equal to uh, a two thirds a of mu times mu to the power one half mu times mu. which is two-thirds epsilon Fermi to the three-halves, uh, no, mu to the three-halves, a of mu over mu to the one-half. So from zero to mu, the epsilon a epsilon is mu over epsilon Fermi, to the power 3 halves times n. So n is equal to n times mu over epsilon Fermi to the power 3 halves plus pi squared kt squared over 6 1 over 2 mu and uh, a mu is 2 pi g v 2 m to the power 3 halves mu to the power 1 half so 1 let's divide by n everywhere 1 is equal to mu over epsilon Fermi cubed, 3 halves, plus uh, pi squared kt over mu squared. Now this is 3, so pi cubed over 3 
times 2m to the power 3 halves gv. times a mu over epsilon fermi no yes mu over epsilon fermi to the power three halves let me multiply by epsilon fermi to the three halves So this is what will give us what the uh, chemical potential, the first correction to the chemical potential. Now let's try to solve this for the chemical potential. We already know that the chemical potential should be epsilon Fermi plus some small correction. Or mu over epsilon Fermi will be equal to 1 plus delta over epsilon Fermi. So what we are trying to determine is delta. So 1 is equal to mu over epsilon Fermi to the 3 halves is 1 plus 1 should be equal to 1 plus 3 halves delta over epsilon Fermi times 1 plus 2m to the power 3 halves pi squared over 2 g times v times epsilon fermi to the three halves. Now this is kt over mu is mu over kt no kt over mu, sorry now this kt over mu will be kt over epsilon fermi times uh, mu over epsilon fermi to the power minus 1. So a kt over epsilon fermi squared mu over epsilon fermi to the minus second power is 1 minus delta over epsilon, epsilon fermi times 2. This is what we have. So let me just, uh, let us multiply it out. So we have a 1 plus 2m to the power 3 halves. Uh, let me make a small correction. I already know that the correction would be uh, kt of the order of kt over uh, epsilon fermi squared. So this delta is, let me put it over here, uh, okay, delta but kt over epsilon fermi squared also. Now the reason is this equation already tells me that the correction to mu from epsilon fermi is of the order of kt squared. Delta is now some uh, small number. Or let me even Go one more step, this is 1 plus delta. So the higher corrections are of the order of k2 over epsilon fermi to the power 4. That is just some number, not necessarily small. So here uh, what I need to do is, here I have kt over epsilon firm kt squared term now let me rewrite it all it's becoming somewhat messy so this is how I define that I'm trying to find what delta is the numerical value of delta so 1 should be equal to 
the cube of this one, this is 1 plus cube root 3 halves of delta over epsilon Fermi, not delta. Delta times kt over epsilon Fermi squared. 1 plus, let me just call all these things C. kt over epsilon Fermi squared times uh, 1 minus 2 delta kt over epsilon Fermi. Well, I don't even need to take that correction because that's a higher order kt to the power 4. Up to kt squared term, I can just replace this with epsilon Fermi. So 1 is equal to 1 plus, this is 1 plus a kt over epsilon Fermi squared. So here 3 over 2 delta plus c. And this tells me that delta is 2 thirds c. Now c is all these numbers over here. a minus sign. So now I know what uh, mu is. Mu is epsilon Fermi times 1 minus kt over epsilon Fermi squared times 2m to the power 3 halves pi cube over 2 g v epsilon Fermi to the power 3 halves. This is my chemical potential. Now, I might have some mistake in calculating this factor, but you can just make correct it. This is not V, but volume per particle. Okay. So mu is slightly low, will be slightly lower than the Fermi energy at high temperatures. Now we can go and calculate the energy. Energy will be from 0 to infinity, the epsilon a epsilon times epsilon over e to power beta epsilon minus mu plus 1. This is 0 to mu the epsilon a epsilon plus Okay, a epsilon was equal to, I need that there, that factor. Okay, this is our a epsilon. Plus pi squared over six. This was our uh, correction factor. Let's see where did I have that? Okay, pi squared over six, uh, kt squared, the derivative of the integral. A of mu times mu squared times uh, three halves, or just mu. Because you say a, a epsilon epsilon is proportional to epsilon to the power three halves. Uh, if I if I take its derivative, it is three halves times a, no, just me. Okay. 
So this, this is just a epsilon to the power three halves, this product. If I take the derivative, it brings a three halves times epsilon to the power one half, but that's nothing but a epsilon. And here the correction is a of mu. So u is uh, the integral will be a of mu times mu uh, times uh, two thirds plus pi squared over six kt squared. Now this is pi squared over four now. A of mu. Well, you see, you. Okay. Now, what we can do, we can just put in the factors. U is equal to two thirds times two pi g v. No. No, okay, I, I will avoid it. Now we can basically do the same thing. Just substitute what a, a was, and you would obtain that u is equal to a three fifth n epsilon Fermi. This is the zero temperature limit. 1 plus uh, some coefficient, let's just call it alpha, kt over epsilon Fermi squared. Plus, of course, there will be corrections of the order of k2 over epsilon Fermi to the power 4. So you can just continue and put in the numbers and obtain what this alpha is. Now, the specific heat is just du by dt. You see, the first term doesn't contribute. It's just the first core. This term would contribute, and you see that it's proportional to the temperature. So it goes to zero linearly. So if you remember, at high temperatures, it, uh, the specific heat goes to the classical limit, but it approaches the classical limit from below. So it just as you lower the temperature, it will uh, the specific heat gets smaller and smaller, and eventually at t equal to zero, the specific heat will go to zero linearly with temperature. And the pressure will be just proportional to U. So the pressure also has this, uh, this form at low temperatures. So any questions about this? So the trick is basically if you want to obtain the thermodynamic relationships or expressions for the thermodynamic properties in terms of temperature, volume, the chemical potential, it's temperature, volume, pressure, and volume, the first thing you have to do is you have to express the chemical potential in terms of those. And you can do that by just using the defining relation of the chemical potential. That's this one. And at various limits, you can obtain approximate expressions for the chemical potential. At large temperatures, the, chem the Z is almost zero. The chemical potential is, uh, well, Z is almost zero. That simplifies it a lot at high temperatures. But at low temperatures, the chemical potential is around the Fermi energy, the deviation will be small, and this is basically the, we had obtained, the, uh, this is the deviation from the uh, Fermi energy. You see that as long as you don't reach temperatures, uh, like Fermi temperature values, that correction will be very small. And in fact, this, uh, if you calculate the, for example, the specific heat of solids, you see, if you calculate the specific heat of solids, there will be the phonons' degrees of freedom. If you just calculate the phononic degrees of freedom and their contribution to the specific heats, you obtain a quite a good value for the specific heats of solids, ignoring the electrons. You see, there are a huge number of electrons, electronic degrees of freedom, which you can just ignore in calculating the specific heat. Basically, the reason is this one. The room temperature is much lower than the Fermi energy. And the the, any contribution to the specific heat from the uh, electrons will be suppressed by KT. Uh, any contribution to the energy will be suppressed by this factor, T. 
tea over the firm temperature, which is of the, something less than 1% typically. So you, they don't contribute, they are, they are just frozen, you cannot really excite them. Okay, so that's kind of all for today. Any questions? Then see you next week. We will look at some application, some other applications of these fermionic systems. And we will also look at magnetism. Are they magnetized? And electron gas. Well, we will discuss it next week.